Well, good morning. It looks like we're admitting everyone in as we uh, come on in. So good morning and welcome to eRefCom. Um, today we have a presentation by Chorus and they'll be speaking on um, leveraging the cloud for process operator training. Uh, we will ask everyone to remain on mute through the presentation. Um, you do have the option to raise your hand um, in the chat window. You can ask questions through the session. Uh, we will be having Q&A at the end. So please feel free to add questions during the session and we will be getting to those um, about 15 minutes uh, remaining in the session. We'll be doing Q&A and um, you can unmute yourself during that time too to be able to ask a question if you'd like. And I will turn it over to Nathan who will be starting the presentation. Great, thanks Marlia and good morning everybody. Thank you all for attending the webinar today where we will be discussing and demonstrating how to leverage the cloud for process operator training. My name is Nathan Leonard, and I'll be leading the presentation portion of this webinar. Uh, we also have joining us today, Mr. Jorge Lanza. He's one of our senior engineers who will be leading the simulator demonstration. So I'm gonna start out with the introduction by spending a few minutes discussing our company and then describe the types of operator training simulators. We'll take a look at some of the features of our software platform that we use to build the simulators, and then we'll review a case study from one of our cloud-based OTS projects before moving on to the uh, demonstration. Uh, as Marlia mentioned, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, about 10 or 15 minutes remaining at the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, so Chorus has supplied more than 2,600 OTS systems to the hydrocarbon industry since 1966, starting with the industry's first dynamic process simulator. So if you look over there on the left, you can see the guys in the sideburns and the bell bottoms there. Along the way, we went through several mergers and acquisitions, including RSI and the Simcon business unit from ABB and we consolidated under the Chorus name in 2017. Uh, Chorus has offices across the globe with headquarters in France, three locations in the US, two in China, as well as offices in India and Cyprus. Uh, we play in all segments of the industry, including upstream, midstream, and downstream, but the majority of our clients include the major downstream operators, uh, EPCs and technology licensors. So let's begin by understanding what an operator training simulator is. So if you compare it to a plant, a plant has process units like a, an FCC or a distillation unit. Uh, there are field operators who are in the field opening and closing valves, starting and stopping pumps, et cetera. You have a DCS control system. You have an SIS or ESD control system, and you have your DCS operator stations in your control room. Now, if you look in the operator training simulator world, the process units are modeled in Corus's Indus Plus dynamic simulation platform, which runs on a Windows desktop PC or a Windows server. We offer an optional field operator station where a field operator trainee can perform field functions. This can also be incorporated into the instructor station. Uh, the DCS would be simulated by a DCS simulator. The SIS would be simulated by an SIS simulator. Then you would have your DCS operator trainee stations. The component that doesn't have an equivalent in the plant is the instructor station. This is where the instructor will run the simulation, introduce malfunctions, activate training scenarios, et cetera, which we'll see uh, more in the demo. So OTS systems are specified by three categories of characteristics. Uh, the first is whether it will be a standard or a custom model. Uh, a standard model is based on a typical process unit design and a custom model is plant specific. 
So back to this one here. The second category is in regards to how the DCS and SIS systems are simulated. So an emulated system means that the control system is modeled within the process model environment. A linked system uses soft controllers from the DCS and SIS vendors loaded with an exact copy of the real control system. The third category is in regards to model fidelity. So a high fidelity model is designed using first principles of chemical engineering and is typically accurate to within plus or minus 2% across all operating conditions. A low fidelity model is intended to respond just directionally and a medium fidelity model is a hybrid of the two, essentially a, a low fidelity model with some critical parts of it modeled in high fidelity. The OTS model we're gonna demo for you today is a standard emulated high fidelity model deployed in the cloud. A course owns a proprietary simulation software platform called Indus Plus. It's a high fidelity and extremely accurate in matching the actual plant performance. It can be used for DCS link or emulation, and it easily allows for linking to third party software via the CAPE open interface standard, which allows for plug and play interoperability with third party process modeling components such as compressor or reactor models. It includes a trending and data historian. It allows for using DCS graphics on the instructor station and field operator station HMIs. And it has advanced functionality, which we will get into when we run the software demo. Uh, this is a case study of one of our refi refining clients that really highlights the value of cloud deployed standard models. Uh, this client faced some challenges as they had minimal experience with simulation based training. However, they knew they needed it as their workforce was aging and they were losing plant experience. Another issue they faced is that they needed to train across multiple refining sites, which largely operated independently. They also had a mixture of Delta V and Honeywell DCS across their sites, which would mean multiple HMIs for the simulators. And ultimately they were under a schedule and budget constraint from management. So working with them in the bidding stage, we developed a solution that would address all of their major pain points and we provided them with 11 standard models covering most of their common process units across their three sites. The selection of standard versus custom models was a good fit because of their multiple refining sites having a lot of the same process units, but with not identical configurations. So the standard model was a compromise between all three sites. It allowed for the trainees to become familiar with the process units behavior to train on running at different throughputs, practicing startup and shutdown procedures, and learning how to react to equipment malfunctions and emergency conditions. Deploying the models in the cloud allowed all the sites to train from anywhere at any time, which has been especially helpful in this time of remote working. The hardware cost was minimal, just desktop computers, and the standard models were very short lead times, so the simulation-based training program could meet management schedule deadlines. Uh, the models are being provided with both Honeywell and Delta V DCS selectable by the instructor, allowing the trainees to train using the same DCS that they have in their plant. The client is leasing their models, which amounts to a fraction of the cost of owning custom models. And this allowed them to stay within the budget uh, management had approved. In rough numbers, the total cost of a five-year lease of 11 standard models usable by all three sites is equal to the approximate cost to own one custom model usable by one site. And with their limited experience with simulation-based training, our training experts consulted for them and developed a corporate training program master plan, which structured their training program to incorporate the simulators. Included in that plan was the development of companion training manuals for each model. Uh, this is something that we co-developed with their SMEs to provide a complete classroom curriculum and training scenarios of importance to each site. So there are several different ways that the cloud system can be configured. Uh, it's just a few examples here for Air Liquide, the trainees are able to self-train 
so that no instructor is required. Uh, the trainees can act activate pre-configured training scenarios themselves. Uh, Sitco allows for multiple trainees using the same model under one instructor. And IFP training allows for multiple trainees to use different models under one or more instructors. So it's very flexible how the uh, cloud can be configured. So this is the final slide before we transition into the demonstration. Uh, these are all of the standard refinery models that we can provide. Uh, and if there's an interest uh, for a trial of one or more of these standard models, please feel free to contact me after the presentation for more information. So in, in terms of commercial structure, uh, these models are available on a subscription basis. With a subscription, we include setting up the selected models in the cloud and providing login credentials to the instructors and trainees. We'll provide a training session for the users and the instructors with additional support as needed. In terms of training materials, the models come with the user manual, which gets pretty granular in the description of the process unit and control schemes, as well as the simulator functions and startup procedures. Then we also provide a customized companion training manual, or CTM. Uh, this is a classroom curriculum and a description of the custom simulator training scenarios developed in coordination with your SMEs. And finally, as an option, we can consult on your overall training program and develop a master plan to incor incorporate multiple simulation models into the curriculum, which is especially useful if the models will be used for multiple sites. Uh, so the model demo is next. And with that, I will transition over to Jorge. All right, thank you, Nathan. Let me, uh... Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jorge Llanza and I'm a, a senior engineer at uh, Chorus. I'm located in uh, Houston, Texas. And in this webinar, we're going to go through an operator training session using an FCC model that is executing in the, in the cloud. But first I'm going to introduce to you the components of the simulator you will see during this demo. I'm going to address the cloud portal that we're, that we're using, the uh, described instructor station, the training station, the functionalities of each. Then we're gonna review the model, and then we're going to run a, uh, a training scenario. And we'll touch on the trainee performance monitor, which is part of the training scenario. This is an application that essentially is evaluating or grading the uh, the performance of the uh, trainee, as the trainee essentially goes through a, uh, a training session. So let's start first with the, um, let's say the cloud. And as you can see here, you see that this is the model. And you see four tabs up here. We are using Amazon Web Services to provide the, the cloud services. And the first tab is called a, a, the chorus portal. And in this tab, this is, a, this is where the instructor can start the uh, model and, in the, and stop the model. And also the instructor can see that we have the instructor viewer, that's, that's the instructor station graphics. And we also have the uh, operator console graphics. Uh, we call them the viewer trainee. And all of these are active right now and connected to the system. If we go to this Amazon AppStream uh, tab, this is the instructor screen. And the graphics that the instructor has are the same graphics as the, um, as the trainee or operator on his screen. Except that the trainee does not have, the trainee screen does not have this ribbon up here that essentially is what the instructor uses to control the, uh, the training session. I'm just going to go briefly to over to this other chorus portal. And this is really the trainee, the way the trainee connects to the model. You see, the trainee sees that the, the model that's running is the FCCU model. 
and uh, essentially it's 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 available and that's a way the trainee connects to the, uh, the model. Then we have, and this other tab is the the uh, operator console or the or the trainee graphics. And again, these are the same as the uh, instructor graphics, except you don't have the controls. So the the instructor is the one that can start and stop the uh, simulation. So let's go back here briefly to the instructor station. And let's just uh, give you an, an idea what the instructor can do. The instructor can start, stop, freeze the uh, simulation You're running using these buttons. The instructor can change the uh, speed of the simulation from normal, which is real time, to maybe fast. If we're doing something that requires a lot of time, we can accelerate the uh, simulator to do it in less time. And we can also run in a slow mode. The, uh, this also the, the uh, instructor has what we call snapshots and initial conditions. For example, in this model, the model comes with two uh, initial conditions, a cold start and a normal operation initial condition. But you can also, as trainers, you can also uh, uh, create your own snapshots. I've created one that's called New Normal Operation US. And this is a um, uh, initial condition or a snapshot that we're going to be using for our training scenario. Other uh, differences between the operator uh, graphics and the instructor graphics is these modes. These modes allow the operator, for example, if we go to this this mode that has this lightning symbol and we click on it and what happens in the screen is that anything that has this symbol can be uh, for example failed we can create a, a, a malfunction of that so for example if i click on on this i can this is a uh, i can do these malfunctions on the transmitter there's a transmitter that's providing a, uh, a signal to this flow controller. So I, that signal, I can fail the signal low or high, I can freeze it, I can bias the signal, apply a gain to it, some drift or some noise. And that's, uh, and so an, a, a, an instructor selects the uh, malfunction and then just hits the uh, OK button and then the malfunction is, is activated. We, the, also the uh, instructor, and so that's what we can use in the in, in this failure. There's another failure. We can also fail the, um, say for example, the heat exchangers can be failed also. So we can actually do a, a shell fouling, and then we can actually uh, enter the percent fouling that we want here, or we can do two fouling, and we can enter the percent over here, and then we can click uh, OK. The also instructor. Uh, has uh, another um, uh, mode that uh, can be used. And in this case, the mode is uh, it's called the uh, FOD mode. And the FOD mode is allows the instructor, let me go to another screen where the FOD mode is, can be seen much better. So I'll, I'll get out of FOD mode. This is a normal uh, feed drum. This is where the the feed to the reactor is uh, preheated. So if I click on FOD up here, I do, as you will see, these lines up here, that these, these lines are with valves up here, and these lines are not in the operator graphics, because the, so the operator cannot control or manipulate these valves from the, from his, from the board, from his. So he has to rely on the outside operator to open or close these valves. So in the case of a training, the instructor can also act as the, uh, as the outside operator. So the instructor then can, can manipulate these valves. He can uh, you know, open or close these, these valves. So that's another feature of the, of the uh, FOD mode, which, is, which stands for Field Operator Device. So it, it's, it's devices that are, do not appear in the console graphics of the operator, but appear in the instructor graphics. 
Another feature of the uh, system is the, we, we can change, by clicking this mode, we can change battery limits. Any, we can change the pressure, temperature of streams coming into, we can change its pressure and temperature. We can also change the, the composition of the stream coming in. If we want, we can actually then, by changing its mole percent over here, by making it 10%, we make this feed heavier. By setting this to zero, we can make the feed uh, lighter. And this also normalizes itself as, as we make these changes. So these are some of the um, differences between the, uh, for example, the, the instructor screen and the uh, operator screen. Another feature of the FOD is that some of the valves, control valves, also have bypasses. So there could be some exercises in which we fail the valve, either open or closed, and then the solution to the, to the, to the situation is to essentially control using the bypass valve. So in those cases, we can actually then close the upstream block valve or close the downstream block valve and then open the, uh, the bypass valve. So this is another example of the operator or the instructor acting as a, an outside operator. Now let's go to the, the operator screen or the training screen and the training screen things that the, um, the trainee can do, let's say this is a flow controller, and the trainee can actually change set point. Let me, uh, let me go back for a minute. Let me go to the, the uh, instructor screen, and I'm gonna start the uh, simulator running. And I'll go back to the operator screen. And then we, change, uh, we can change the set point Okay, we'll, we'll make it. So that's one, that's one uh, uh, function that the operator can do, that the operator can do. And then we can also, the operator can also, uh, he can actually he can get a trend of that variable. So here we have the trends. We can, the, the, uh, also the, uh, Operator can, uh, can change the mode of the controller from automatic to manual. And then enter, uh, you know, say 60%. So these are the things that the operator can do from the screen. Operators can also uh, start, stop. In this case, you can start, stop pumps. These pumps uh, can be uh, stopped or, or started. For example, in this case, we can, we can start a pump. So these are, this is what the operator essentially, uh, how he re, the operator reacts to the situation by stopping a pump or, or uh, starting a pump or changing the, the, the mode of a controller to manual, et cetera. So that's uh, kind of the function. So he has an alarm. There's an alarm summary. No alarms in it. So now let's uh, review the model quickly. So I'll give you a quick uh, overview of the model. Let's uh, start with the, it's an overview of the model. And um, the feed comes in, it's preheated. It goes to a, a reactor. It's where the, uh, it's mixed. It, it's mixed with catalysts. It comes from the regenerator. And essentially the reaction takes place in the reactor. The reaction products flow out as an overhead vapor to the fractionator where the, that overhead vapor is separated into products. There are, in this case, there are three main, what we call side stream products, a heavy NAFTA, and what we call an LCO product, and a medium cycle oil product. And then you have your, your bottoms, which is your slurry. The fractionator also has three pump rounds. It has an HCO, HCO pump around, a light cycle oil pump around, and a heavy naphtha pump around. And then the overhead gas essentially gets sent to 
which has the, the overhead gas also contains products and also contains fuel gas, contains LPG, contains some of the gasoline. And it's sent to the wet gas compressor where it gets compressed, goes to a high pressure receiver, and then it goes into this section of the plant called the gas concentration unit. And the main purpose of the gas concentration unit is to produce, uh, separate that, that uh, feed into a fuel gas, a LPG product, and a debutanizer gasoline product. So these are, this is a primary absorber, this is a sponge absorber, this is a stripper, and this is a, the, uh, the butanizer. So now that uh, you know, we've explained the, uh, the model, now let's, uh, I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna be doing. Let's go back to the, uh, the, trainee, the instructor station and I'm gonna stop the model right now. I'm gonna open this tab, which is the instructors, where the instructor has the scenarios, the training scenarios that have been already defined for this model. And I just opened this big scenario here. And so we're gonna be running scenario 2-2. Two, two. And I'm going to explain what scenario 2-2 two, two does. So scenario 2-2 two, two is documented in this, in this uh, manual. This is a manual for the instructor. This is a, the, we call it the companion training manual but it's a manual that uh, the instructor receives where all these exercises are documented. So now let's, let's go down and let's take a look at the exercise or the scenario that we're gonna be running today, which is scenario 2-2, two, two. there it is. So scenario 2-2, two, two, as you can see, is the narratives that says, the scenario simulates the failure of the transmitter that provides the input temperature signal to the reactor temperature controller, TC219. A transmitter is biased by 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that TC219 is going to see a temperature 25 degrees above its set point. TC219 will react by closing the regenerated catalyst slide valve to decrease the amount of catalysts entering the reactor, riser, to decrease the amount of heat provided by the catalyst and thus decrease the reactor's temperature. This situation results in a decrease in conversion, resulting in less production of light products, fuel gas, LPG, debutanizer gasoline, heavy crack naphtha, and an increase in the production of the heavier products, which are LCO, MCO and slurry. This manifests itself by an increase in the bottoms level of the main fractionator due to the increase in the volume of heavy products. This level increase causes an alarm to be activated, which is what informs a trainee that there is a problem. So what we strive to do in these training scenarios is that the trainee is notified that something is, is not right by an alarm. And that starts the trainees, let's say, troubleshooting of the situation. So the aim of these training scenarios is to improve the trainee's know-how of the unit. We call that a mental model that the trainee has of the unit. And what we're trying to do is to improve the trainee's understanding of how the unit works by repeatedly doing uh, similar training scenarios so that uh, the trainee can improve his skills of troubleshooting and can improve his decision making. So this situation also manifests itself in a decrease in the top reflux of the column due to a decrease in the amount of overhead gas reaching the top of the column due to the decrease in conversion. The trainee has to analyze the situation using the data being displayed on the screens and using trends to detect the anomaly or anomalies that are causing the abnormal situation. So in this scenario, we have the scenario objectives. We haven't talked about TPM, but the TPM stands for Trainee Performance Monitor. That's an application that essentially runs in parallel with the training scenario. 
And in this application, essentially, is grading the, uh, the performance of the trainee. In this case, we've elected uh, to uh, define two variables that the TPM is going to monitor during the training scenario. The first variable is really the controller mode of the temperature controller. And what we're saying is that we want the desired state of the temperature control to be manual. That's how the trainee is going to solve the problems by, by changing the controller mode to manual. So our des desired state is manual. As long as this controller is in automatic, the TPM is going to subtract points from the score of the trainee. So that means when a training scenario begins, the trainee has a perfect score, let's say of 100. But as, as, a, as the controller, in this case, the controller state or controller mode is in automatic, the TPM is going to start subtracting, deducting points. Another variable that we selected is this variable, which is an HCO flow to tray 38. I'll explain that later. In this case, the TPM is going to start subtracting points or deducting points once that flow crosses 21,500 barrels per day. So, so when it goes above 21,500 barrels per day, the TPM is going to start uh, subtracting points from the overall score. So here we have, this is information for the instructor. This is the best score for this scenario, 71.89, because the corrective action was taken immediately. So we can compare the training's performance to this score, which is the best. And then uh, the fail point, and normally we give the trainee more time. In this case, we're, we're going to do a, uh, a scenario that only lasts 25 minutes or 15 minutes or so. And we also tell the, the instructor actions. The instructor runs the ATE, which is scenario 2-2, to start the exercise. ATE stands for automatic training exercise. And it's a way of, of actually condensing all the manual actions that the, that the instructor would have to do and so to prevent him to, so that he doesn't have to do them. So the ATE scenario does those actions automatically. So the instructor only has to click on the, a, on the ATE to essentially start executing the scenario. So this ATE or automatic training exercise introduces a bias malfunction with a target value of 25 and a ramp of 60 seconds to the transmitter of the reactor temperature transmitter. So the instructor should at the ATE stop the scenario to ensure that the duration of the scenario is the same for all trainees. In addition, the CTM or this companion training manual has the actions has uh, written down or has captured what the subject matter expert of an, of an FCC would do how to, how to trouble, how he or she would troubleshoot this particular abnormal situation. So this is more information for the instructor. The instructor doesn't have to be a subject matter expert of the unit. We've captured that know-how in this, in this table. So, and we don't expect the trainee to essentially follow each, each one of these steps. But as the trainee gains more experience, his performance will start approximating these uh, these steps. So this steps capture the best way to attack or troubleshoot the uh, <coughs> excuse me this scenario or this uh, uh, problem that we're going to uh, introduce in the uh, in the in the unit. So now let's go back to the uh, to our model, and I'll show you the uh, scenario, I'll, I'll do an edit of the scenario. So let me show you the, these and I'll maximize it. So here, these, each one of these is, is an action that the instructor would have had to perform. And now we've captured these actions and the instructor only has to uh, press click on a button and then the ATE executes these actions. So, 
So what's happening here is that the first action the instructor would have done was to load the snapshot. He, uh, the instructor would have set the simulation speed to fast and start the simulation. And then we have a wait statement, which is it's gonna wait for one minute on the simulation time. So let me explain what the simulation time is. This is the simulation time. So in this case, when simulation time gets to zero, one, zero, zero, then this block will start executing the next block. And the next block is the malfunction itself. This is where we're activating the uh, malfunction. Well, we're essentially saying what type of, of failure or malfunction we want. It's a bias type. We want, what's the target value? Well, the target value is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And what's the direction of the, and we're gonna ramp it. So we're not gonna step it immediately. So we're gonna ramp it uh, at 25 degrees in 60 seconds. Now, one, Reason, the reason we have this one minute is that we want the simulator to run for one minute creating so that we can create a history of the normal operating condition so that the trends will contain history, normal you know, operating condition uh, values so that the uh, trainee then, when, when the trainee uses the trends, he can, com can compare the current values to the you know, normal operating values. So that will be of help to indicate whether things are going up or down, whether he needs to understand what was the, the initial value for this flow, et cetera. So once we have um, created the malfunction, then we still are running in fast because it's going to take about eight minutes, but we're gonna be running in fast. And so what we're gonna do is at the end of the uh, eight minutes and 33 seconds, we're going to start the TPM. And the TPM has been configured, like I told you, with those uh, variables. We, we configure with the, this HCO flow and the controller mode. So that's in there. So the TPM will start the alarm that will be activated at eight minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, and at that point in time, that's when we start the evaluation of the trainee's performance, is when the alarm really is activated. So from then on, the, the trainee, the TPM, is, is starting to run in parallel with the scenario and monitor those two variables. And then finally, we're gonna give the SME until 25, when the, the simulation time reaches 25, that will be the end of the scenario. And then the, this will stop the TPM and will stop the simulator. So that's the, uh, the scenario that we're gonna be running. Uh, I wanted to show you just uh, how these scenarios are essentially uh, built. So we're going to just quickly build a uh, scenario and we're going to essentially go to, we're gonna go to new and the new scenario is at the end of our list. So let's look at exercise of three, I think. And let's look at exercise 03. As you can see, exercise 03 is open, it's blank, it's a blank. And essentially what we can do is, if let's say we can load a snapshot, you know, this is an operator, this is the instructor creating the, uh, the ATE. And we can then set the speed, so we go to the left-hand side, and look for the action that we want. So we can set the, uh, the simulation speed. And we'll set it to say fast. Then we can go and say, okay, we wanna start running the simulator. So we'll, we'll start running the uh, simulator. And then we'll uh, start the, um, 
will will set the the uh, the malfunction. In this case, I wanted to set the malfunction of a. Let me just quickly go to my. And let me erase this for a minute. I'll go to fractionator B. So this is a view of the fractionator. And what we want to be able to do here is there's a valve here that we want to close. So we want to do the, the, the malfunction. It's, the action is called a right parameter value. And the, uh, the valve that we want to close is called FC311. And we put a dot there. So right now the, uh, so now we need to look for the parameter that uh, we want. And it's really a failure parameter. So we want to, opening failure parameter. So we hit tab and we say we want it to be true. Then we have the uh, A underscore. So now we want to tell it the position of the valve. So we go back. And then we tell the position of the valve blocked opening target, we give it that, and it's 0%, so we don't have because we want to close the valve. And then we want to just uh, say, okay, let's uh, uh, enter a uh, wait statement, and we're going to wait another, say, 15 minutes. And we're going to Stop the simulator. Stop the simulator. Over here. Well, my top simulator is, I'll go down and put it here. So we're gonna stop the simulation. And that concludes, that's one way of doing the, uh, the exercise. So we save it, we close it, and we say yes, save, save it. There's another way of doing it, and I'll go through it very quickly because we're running, our time is running short. So there's another way, quickly, and this is a, what we call a record function. And the record function, we'll, we'll, go, we'll use exercise of four, then we'll say record. And the recording function now just uh, records the actions of the instructor. So if the instructor wants to load the snapshot, it records that and essentially enters that. Then the uh, changing the speed of the simulator, it, it does that. It runs the simulator. Then uh, Let's go to this valve, the valve that we wanted to fail. Let's see. Fail that valve. And we wanted to do a fail, we want to do a fail open of that valve that's already at zero percent, a fail close of that valve, so it's already at zero percent. And we do okay. So it creates the, uh, the failure automatically, and then at the end we say stop. So we'll stop the, uh, the simulator, so it, 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 it also enters that. So that's another way which is easier, much easier than actually going through the drag and drop. And uh, this is the way I uh, do most of these uh, scenarios, it's doing the, uh, the record, so we, we save and close. So now let's uh, start the uh, training scenario because we're really, uh, so I'm going to 
start a training scenario, scenario 2-2. As you can see, then I'm going to click on uh, Run. And then since there's a TPM, the scenario will ask you, okay, what's the instructor name? So you can enter the instructor, the instructor enters uh, his or her name, and also enters the trainee name, and says, yes, compute an evaluation score, and say, start. So now, it's loading the uh, snapshot, it's checking the simulator, and essentially, as you can see up here, it's running the simulator. It's, uh, it's, it has completed all these actions. It's, it's generated the history for the trends that we wanted for, for that one minute. It already failed the transmitter, and now we're just waiting for the dynamics of the model to essentially get to the condition where the alarm is going to be uh, uh, detected. So while we're waiting, I can show you again this, uh, this uh, you know, the trainee performance monitor, or actually I'm gonna show you the, uh, the training scenario that we're actually doing. It's essentially, there's this temperature controller, uh, which is a, controls the temperature of the reactor, and this temperature controller is essentially receiving a signal, the temperature of the, uh, the reactor temperature. And it's receiving the signal from a uh, transmitter. So what we've done is this signal that is coming from a transmitter, we have biased that signal by 25 degrees. So this controller is going to see this, this uh, signal or this temperature starting to increase. So it'll go to 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, and the controller will then take action. So the controller will then start reducing the catalyst flow to the reactor, such that it'll start decreasing really the reaction or the conversion level of the reactor. So that's what's, uh, what's going to happen right now. So we can go back to our model. And we're almost there. It, uh, we're waiting for the uh, alarm to essentially get uh, uh, activated. And then what's going to happen is the, uh, we'll go to the uh, operator screen. And the operator, this is when the exercise starts. The operator will, will go to the alarm summary then we'll start looking at the alarm. What, what kind of alarm is it? Oh, it's a level control alarm. And it's the fractionator bottom. And it's an output high alarm. So he says, OK, the level controller in the bottom of the column is, has an output high alarm. So it navigates back to, Essentially, in this case, it's going to go to the A view of the fractionator, which is the bottom view of the fractionator, and confirms, yes, my, my level controller has saturated. It's maxed out at 100%, and I can see the level increasing. So what does the uh, trainee do? At this point in time, the trainee th thinks, well, based on his knowledge of the unit, his mental model of the unit, says, well, if the level is increasing in the bottom, that means that there's more liquid or internal reflux reaching the, uh, the bottom of the column. So let me take a look at the trace here in the column in the, in the, above the bottom and see if I can find something. So he goes to this view, which is a, the, the B view of the fractionator where you have your products. And, and there's a very interesting loop here, which is, this is a, tray 37 is a chimney tray. And essentially, this is a, an HCO flow, this is an HCO, HCO, and there's a loop here that transfers liquid from this tray to the tray below it, tray 38. So essentially, he's gonna, the, uh, upper, the, up, the trainee is gonna say, let me, let me trend this HCO flow to tray 38. And it sees that the flow is actually this FC310, the flow is increasing. He says, ha ha. So I have my flow increasing. Well, why? He goes back to the, so why 
if my flow is increasing here, that means that the level in this tray is increasing. So it's receiving, there's more liquid flowing to this tray. So, but this liquid, where is this liquid coming from? This liquid might, it has to come from up here, but I'm gonna look at my pump rounds. It takes a quick look at the pump rounds and sees the pump rounds haven't changed. So that's not, this pump around hasn't changed. It looks at this pump around. This pump around looks normal. So there's no more additional internal reflux being uh, entering the column. It looks at the, is pr the product flow meters. So your flow controllers for the products are okay. They look, they look pretty normal. So, so far I haven't, the trainee hasn't seen a, a cause for the increase in the level. They say, okay, let me take a look at the overhead. So he comes to the overhead and he says, aha, he looks at the temperature. There's a temperature controller controlling the, the temperature of the overhead vapor. And he sees that the temperature controller has dropped from 200, 204 to 201. So the trainee says, aha, my overhead vapor is lighter in composition. You know, a, a, a lower temperature means a lighter composition, which means that he says, but what happened to the heavy portion of my overhead gas? Maybe that, so did it, was it condensed over here? But I didn't see any changes in my internal refluxes. So what's going on? I know that I have what seems to be less overhead gas. The trainee says, okay, let me go to the compressor, see what the wet gas compressor is telling me. And the wet gas compressor says, okay, let me trend, let me look at the speed of the compressor. And so he looks at the speed of the compressor, which is this red, and the speed is decreasing. He says, aha, I, you know, there is, there is definitely less overhead gas reaching the top of the column. Something's happening. If I cannot attribute that, so he starts thinking, if I cannot attribute that to a uh, internal reflux changing in the column, let me look at my reactor. So he goes to the reactor and sees that the reactor temperature has increased. And he said, wait a minute, this temperature, I was expecting this temperature to be lower because I, I thought that the conversion of the unit was decreasing. It was, you're making less uh, overhead gas, you're making more of the bottoms. So I was expecting this temperature to be lower but then he keeps looking, observing the uh, data, and then he looks at this temperature and he says, oops, this temperature normally is the same as this temperature. But right now it's 25 degrees lower. So what's going on? I mean, that's a big red flag right there. So the trainee says, okay, let me go to the regenerator and see what story the regenerator is telling me. So he looks at the, the regenerator temperature, a trend of the generator temperature and he sees that regenerator temperature has been going down and the uh, so the trainee says aha i think that's the problem is that there is less coke being produced in the in the uh, in the reactor and that's due because the conversion level has dropped so which means that this temperature is, is, is incorrect. And this is the real temperature of the reactor. The reactor is now operating at 25 degrees below its normal temperature. So the trainee says, okay, the only way to solve this right now is to, I'm gonna change the mode of this controller. I'm gonna put it in, in, in manual. And I'm going to increase the catalyst flow to the reactor. So that should start bringing the temperature back up again. And so at this point in time, the instructor over here says, ah, okay, the trainee really has done everything that uh, we wanted. And uh, he has troubleshooted the, uh, the exercise correctly. He's done the uh, analysis correctly. He's uh, finally, uh, uh, change the mode of the controller. So now I'm going to let these, the simulation finish and I'm, I'm going to go to fast mode so that I can essentially accelerate the uh, completion of the, uh, of the simulation. So meanwhile, what the uh, 
you know, the trainee can start looking at, uh, you know, meanwhile, we can go back to the screen. So at this point, the trainee essentially has done, uh, he has, a, the trainee has accomplished the objectives of scenario. It's finding out that the scenario conversion uh, decreased due to a bias of the temperature. So the trainee now says, okay, let me look at my fractionator A, look, look at the level here, the, you know, the level here is decreasing. That's good. So things are co coming down. So, so my level there is uh, decreasing. And uh, I'll put it in 15 minutes, 30 minutes. So it's going down. Let me take a look at my other, uh, my B view, my HCO flow. Over here, that's the HCO flow from tray 37 to tray 38. So the HCO flow is it's starting to uh, go down, which means that we're starting to produce less heavy material and produce more of the light material, which is good. So the conversion is increasing. The, uh, what the, uh, the trainee then says, let me go to the top of the column and see how the, the overhead is, 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 is behaving. So he sees in the overhead that all of a sudden he says, oops, my temperature used to be 201, now it's a 207. And this is, uh, so that's good because that means that my overhead vapor has increased. Now it's just a matter of, uh, the temperature controller bringing the temperature down to 204, but that's a good indication that now I have a more conversion in the reactor and that's being reflected in the, uh, in the column. And then he goes to uh, go to the compressor, looking at the uh, speed of the compressor and uh, looking at the trend of the compressor and sees that the the speed of the compressor is increasing because the compressor now has more overhead vapors to, uh, to, to compress. So that's a good sign. So everything looks uh, pretty good. Now we go back to the instructor station and the scenario has concluded. We get our uh, the training performance uh, monitoring report. It says that their training received a score of 60.69%. And this 60.69% is based on this flow controller, this FC310, it's that HCO flow to tray 38. It says that it crossed 21,500 one, one time, and it stayed above 21,500 uh, for six minutes and 35 seconds. So it, it gave this score. But, and also, and then the controller, the TC219 controller, what it's telling us, it, it was in automatic mode. It stayed in automatic mode for six minutes and 21, 21 seconds before the trainee changed the mode to manual. So that's contributing this, this score to, this is the contribution of this, uh, uh, this variable to the score. So it gives you, the training performance report gives you more information. It gives you the everything. This is the, the what cost the uh, trainee points because it essentially crossed the line. But right now, and then the TPM st stopped deducting points at this point. And then the we can take a look at the controller mode, and the controller wasn't automatic for this amount of time before it, it, it went to manual. So if the trainee can analyze the problem faster and move this line towards the left, then he'll get, the trainee will get a, a higher score. So normally, we, then you can, you, you can save the, uh, the report and you can print it, or both. That, today, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to. One more, one more thing, we're almost out of time here. There's a replay function that allows you to allows you to get this thing allows you to follow the actions of the trainee. So you can this while the, while the scenario is going, this 
function, which we call a replay, is uh, recording the actions of the uh, of the trainee. Yeah. So uh, like that. So so here we see that one more. Here we see that the trainee essentially everything that happened during this training session is kind of recorded. And the training session started at simulation time zero. We ran the simulation zero at, at, at one minute do the simulation. That's when the failure occurred. And then the at eight minutes, 25, the simulation speed changed to normal. And then at 1454, this is where the trainee changed the controller mode to manual. So this is very, very, uh, very interesting. And then at 1458 also tells us that the trainee changed the output of the controller in manual mode to 35%. And so, and then at 1541, the, the, uh, the instructor changed the speed to fast. So this is another way that the instructor has to follow the, the actions of the trainee and we can even follow the actions of the expert, essentially trying to solve this uh, this situation. So we can also see, record the actions of the uh, subject matter expert in the FCC. Okay. That, uh, Excuse me. This is Greg Deerwater, of course. I just want to mention we're our time's up. However, the meeting can run longer if you want to hang on. We can answer questions. Right now, there have been a number of questions, maybe a dozen or so, but I would encourage everybody, if you don't want to speak, just type into your chat box any questions you may have that have come to mind during the conference today or the webinar, and we'll get back to you and answer them by email. Uh, but um, if you do stick around, for those that do stay, we can um, go through the questions that have been submitted so far. So go ahead and submit your questions, and uh, thanks for attending. Okay, thank you very much. So right now, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, just uh, have everybody have any questions about entering the chat? I think you can find the control on the bottom of your Zoom meeting and just click on chat and you can type in anything you want and it'll be recorded and we'll get back to you. Some of the questions, Jorge, that have come in, um, Okay, uh, you get to choose the weightage of points on different points. Yes. Uh, let me just read them out. Uh, is it possible to know the score of the operator in a specific scenario in order to design scenarios for improving competencies? Yes, this is what we're doing here. We're giving you the score of the operator for this scenario. And, we're, and then we also have the score that the expert got for this scenario. So let's say if the expert got 80% for this scenario and the operator gets 75%, uh, we know that this is a, an operator that's very good. It's almost as good as the expert. If the operator gets 40%, then we, we know that operator essentially needs more, more uh, practice on the, uh, on the simulator. So you have the option of scoring or not scoring, like pass fail or putting a percentage either way. But if you do use the percentage, you can't get 100%. So what happens is the best performance of the best person sort of becomes the benchmark and say it's 85%, then anybody can try to attain that. And also the, the trainee can practice against the scenario and establish improved right. score over time so he should keep getting better and then he sort of feels better right so another also, question is that uh, is the chorus using digital licenses for the cloud in order to improve training when a company has several operator in different place so um that's a license. there's no license fee here this is a services deal meaning <clears throat> you just tell us which model you want and where you, how many users and where they're located and you can get access uh, it's essentially only limited by the models that you pick and how many people you want to train sort of in a maximum scenario. Um, there's another question that's good. Is there any limitations on the number of scenarios that can be created? No, no, no limitation. So there are no limitations. I mean, you can have thousands and you can organize them in folders. You can, they would parallel. I think Jorge mentioned the companion training manual, which is our training content, the content that's delivered with the model. So there can be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the scenario folders and the scenarios that are in the companion companion training manual, manual, which has a number of chapters. So 
but then you it's like a living thing you can extend that as you wish and create new scenarios and save them and name them and organize them so it's really cool um, how many concurrent users can be using the system under one subscription each subscription has its own model and instructor view well from so, the, uh, we have a project that I'm currently working on and we can have can you speak up a little bit Jorge there's a project that I'm currently working on and it has a, we can run nine nine models at the same time and we can have essentially three trainees actually nine trainees actually running at the same time so we can have nine models and nine trainees being trained at the same time and this is across three refineries. So this is a project that is across three refineries. Each refinery has the capability of running three models at the same time with, with, with three trainees. So that's a total of uh, nine models and nine trainees. But circumstances may change. You may have four refineries and you may want to have 12 models. So it's just uh, so, it's a matter of uh, configuring the, uh, the cloud. There's really not a limit in one sense because it's just how you design the architecture and, and it's it obviously costs more to run a hundred simultaneous users. Uh, yeah. You will be, re you'll be receiving a copy of the slides, which uh, Nathan had a slide in there that uh, explained the three uh, training scenarios, the team versus the classroom versus the on demand. Um, so yeah, you can add. study that from there. Let me just add, Greg, that it's in the cloud, each model is running in a virtual machine. So they're, not all the models are running in the same machine. Each model, each model is running in its, in its own virtual machine. So that's why you can have lots of uh, models operating at the same time. So one question came up on what's the lead time to deliver a system. So this is a packaged off the shelf deal where you have a model services and training materials and it it's delivered as a uh, term lease contract there's no software license fee it's basically a services software as a service type of thing and um, the lead time is there's usually if you start the project if you're a big organization and you have multiple sites and multiple units and different process licensors and so forth you may want to have a little mini master plan at the beginning to sort of decide how you want, you know, who are you use, who are your users, uh, how many users at one time, how many refineries are participating and so forth. And then there's a sort of like a setup period at the beginning. But uh, once that's done, which usually takes two or three months or less, depending on the organization, then we can deliver these models in the cloud uh, right away. So we do, as Nathan mentioned, uh, have the ability, if you're interested, to engage with you to discuss the model that you, the model or models that you're interested in, and we have uh, an evaluation program for uh, serious people that want to really take a look at this stuff without um, cost consideration. But um, that's that you have to contact us for that. So. This is probably the last call for questions. And of course you have uh, the presenter's emails in the slides. So if anything comes up later, please encourage you to uh, contact us and um, thank uh, Nathan and Jorge for their presentation and also the REFCOM folks for organizing this and all the participants that came in from all over the world. I think we had every hemisphere, uh, some 20 odd com companies represented. It was pretty amazing. Uh, 20 countries represented. So it's very international today, and I hope we spoke slow enough and that you got something out of this. So we will send the presentation out, and there will be a recording of this event as well that can be reviewed. And so with that, I think uh, I'll turn it over to Jorge for any final remarks and RefCom for conclusion. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, what you just saw is a, a typical training session. And what we try to do is give uh, device or, def or design training scenarios that will give the same alarm, but the, the problem is different. 
In one case, it's a lower conversion. In another case, there may be an instrument that's not working correctly, and which forces the trainee, even though the trainee is receiving the same alarm, to essentially do uh, to evaluate this thing and troubleshoot it differently. Because you may say it may be the temperature, but in this case, it was it's not the temperature. So we we strive to to give repetitive training scenarios with the same alarm, but it does, but the, the situation is different. The cause of the situation is different. Anyway, thank you for your participation. All right, thank you, Chorus, for the excellent presentation. And again, they will be following up with attendees with the um, presentation and following up with questions as well. If anyone's questions did not get answered, they will be following up with you. So thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon.